Okay, sorry, I thought we were waiting for one of the speakers. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our panel, Economy, Society, and Law. Uh, I'll present each speaker before their talk, and if we, uh, if we meet the schedule, then I'll, I'll take a couple of questions after each talk and then leave more time for further discussion at the end of all three talks. So our first speaker is James McComish. James is a graduate of the University of Melbourne and the University of Oxford. He's currently a solicitor practicing in commercial litigation in Melbourne, Australia. And until recently, he taught commercial law and legal history at the University of Cambridge. James's talk today is Law in Transition in 16th Century England, Economic Change and Social Context of Litigation. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I am a simple common lawyer, uh, but I felt that I should make at least a gesture to the civilians in the room. So I'm going to begin with um, Rudolf von Jering, lecturing in Vienna in 1872 in the work eventually published as The Struggle for Law. Uh, Jering drew attention to the social and ideological background uh, that lay behind what he saw as the differences in national attitudes towards uh, litigation and the assertion of legal rights. He said that the question is not the material value of a thing, but the ideal value of that legal right. Now there's a whole overlay of German idealist philosophy going on here, but what he went on to say was this. The best proof of this the distinction between the material value of a thing as opposed to the ideal value placed on legal right is afforded by the English people. Their wealth has caused no detriment to their feeling of legal right, and what energy it still possesses, even in pure questions of property, we on the continent have frequent proof enough of in the typical figure of the travelling English salesman who resists being duped by English keepers and hackmen, uh, taxi drivers, uh, uh, with a manfulness which would induce one to think that he was defending the laws of old England itself, who, in case of need, postpones his departure, remains days in the place, and spends ten times the amount of money that he refuses to pay. The people laugh at him and do not understand him. It were better that they do not understand him. Uh, for in the few shillings which the man here defends, old England lives at home in his own country. Everyone understands him, and no one lightly ventures to overreach him. Place an Austrian in the same social position, in the same place as the Englishman. How would he act? I can trust my own experience in the matter, Yering says. Not one in ten would follow the example of the Englishman. Others shun the disagreeableness of the controversy, the making of a sensation, the possibility of misunderstanding to which they might expose themselves, a misunderstanding which the Englishman in England need not worry at, and which he quietly takes into the bargain. That is, the European would pay up. But in the few pieces of silver which the Englishman refuses and which the Austrian pays, their lies conceal than more than one would think of England and Austria. Their lie concealed centuries of the political development and their social life. Now, von Jering is clearly right that English patterns of litigation are expressive of, as he said, centuries of political development and social life. But his emphasis on idealism rather than economic practicality as a motivator for litigation is frankly much more characteristic of his own outlook than of his hypothetical English merchant. So why would an English merchant who could as well be from the 16th century as from the 19th, not shun the disagreeableness of the controversy. What made litigation worth their while? And why did the mid-16th century in England see such a remarkable growth in the volume and value of litigation? So, first some background. Like most European countries of the time, 
England had a diversity of legal venues uh, without a very clear hierarchy or structure. That's an essentially a late 19th century development in English law. Uh, the two principal venues for what we might call commercial debt or contract litigation were the Court of Common Pleas and the Court of King's Bench, each of which sat in Westminster Hall in London, uh, the capital. And you can see here on the slide the Court of Common Pleas in action towards the end of the 15th century. And it didn't look much different uh, 50 or so years later. The judges in red are up the back, the sergeants embracing their clients in the blue at the front. In the middle, the clerks writing on these long rolls of parchment, which to this day are preserved in the National Archives in Kew, which I have spent hours flipping through to generate the statistics you're just about to see. Now, the plea rolls, which they're writing, as you can see in this picture here, of the Court of Common Pleas, are a voluminous record of the cases heard there. And in general terms, each step in the process of litigation is recorded in these roles. Uh, then as now, many more cases were commenced than ever ended up going to trial, uh, never mind going to a judgment on the merits. Uh, by contrast though, the plea roles of the Court of King's Bench, the other sort of commercial common law court, are much less comprehensive because of the innovation called the Bill of Middlesex, which existed from the uh, 15th century. And so it means that these plea rolls only contain references to cases which reached a fairly advanced stage of litigation. The bulk of cases in King's Bench never proceeded beyond the issuing of this bill, that is basically the statement of the plaintiff's claim. Uh, but what we see is if you look at the docket rolls, a very striking increase. Uh, now, my focus has just been on the two counties of Oxfordshire and Berkshire, which are up the River Thames from London. And I've been focusing on the period from 1547, the beginning of the reign of Edward VI, up until 1562, into the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. And what you see is this progressive increase, which I can tell you goes on in a neat linear fashion, basically up until the English Civil War of the mid 17th century. So what you can see here in rough terms is a striking increase which keeps on going. But because of the procedure of the Court of King's Bench, we can't get too much fine detail about what's actually going on in this increase. What cases is it that is causing this rising number of lawsuits? By contrast, the fact that in the common pleas you had these scribes that we saw at the table writing out in voluminous detail every single step along the way, there are not merely more records, but there's more detail in those records about what each case was about and you can separate them out in this chart, which unfortunately, because of the uh, height of the screen, I'll have to explain a little bit. What this chart shows is the number of entries in these records by cause of action, the type of lawsuit involved. By far and away, the biggest category, this big blue line at the top, is debt. I mean, then as now, going to court to recover a debt is probably the largest volume of litigation in most, most systems. So much so that we don't think about it because the law relating to debt isn't very complicated and isn't much discussed at all. Next biggest category, which you'll see is several orders of magnitude lower. The red line here is trespass to land. Uh, land very much in the 16th century as it had been for centuries earlier and would be for several centuries to come was the main source of wealth. And below that you see other lines representing other real property disputes not being trespass, that's this olive line here. Uh, and then replevin, this purple line here which is a particular kind of case about the recovery of goods, typically animals. And normally you'd in fact bring this case because even though you're disputing who has the right to pasture the cows, it's not the cows you care about, but the land right underneath. 
But notice a very striking thing about this chart. We saw when we were talking about King's Bench, where we couldn't really separate out what cases we're talking about. Neat progression upwards. In the common pleas, only one category is increasing in a striking way. All of the others, much the same. A slight increase uh, over the years in question. So, what's really worth remarking upon, and this comes back to the point that Yering was making in his Vienna lecture, is, well, it may be that your Englishman, and particularly your English merchant, was litigious. But it's not as if they suddenly became increasingly litigious about every category of dispute that might end up in court. To the contrary, it's these debt cases that are increasing. People don't care more passionately about trespass or about defamation uh, or about wills and inheritance. So we need to be careful when we think of the Yearing quote, and he of course was famous for many things, but he was not famous as an historian of English law, that perhaps economic rather than idealistic motivations lie behind this increase in litigation in the early modern period. What this chart doesn't reveal is where this increase in debt litigation is coming from. And what I can tell you, because I've been flipping through this parchment so that you don't have to, is that the vast bulk of this increase in debt suits relates to commercial debt and litigation originating in London, typically London merchants or London financiers trying to reclaim debts incurred by provincial trading partners. Uh, and that's why the geographic relation of London, the Thames Valley and the nearby provinces of Oxfordshire and Berkshire is particularly interesting. So what happens if we actually look with great detail at the value of debts which are claimed in the Court of Common Pleas, which was the main court you go to if you had a debt problem? What I have to let you know is the jurisdictional limit of the Court of Common Pleas was two pounds or 40 shillings. If your debt was lower than that amount, and in the mid 16th century, that was a non-trivial amount. It wasn't a big amount of money, but it was certainly more than your average uh, labourer would be earning. You had to go to a local court. So this two pounds limit, so the far column on the right, was your entry point into debt litigation in the common pleas. What's really striking is that, and each of these bars represents one of the sampled years uh, from 1547 up to 1562, is that it's fairly similar. There's no particularly striking increase. In a period of great inflation, where the value of two pounds in 1562 was radically less than what it was in 1547. That's quite an interesting artefact. So the Court of Common Pleas seems to have earned a new clientele suing for a much lower value in real terms of debt at the end of the period I'm sampling than at the beginning. But the data point which is most interesting is this one here, 40 pound debts, where you see quite a striking increase. And what's going on here is we see in the records of the law courts evidence for something that we believe is going on from financial records, which is that the 40 pound bond of obligation, that is a conditional obligation where I say, unless you deliver the barley to me, to my brewery, you must pay me £40. Or, unless you pay me the loan money with interest on a specified date at a specified place, you must pay £40 in default. These conditional bonds for the value of £40, which was a lot of money, and certainly much more than the actual commercial value of the transaction which underlied it, that became a standard financing technique as the 16th century went on. And we can see that only because we trawl through the records of the common pleas to see the value of debts which people are claiming. Now, the reason that the increase in, value, in the level of debt litigation as opposed to other litigation is profoundly important is 
simply because people did not become more litigious in any generic sense. They didn't care more passionately about the law or the ideal value of vindicating their rights by going to court. Rather, financing techniques had changed. The increase in London-based trade changed. Uh, and inflation, of course, made both legal services uh, and also the value of small trade debts made them much more within the reach of ordinary people. So, thus far I've been speaking about cases which plaintiffs have brought. That's basically been the data we've looked at the last few charts, the value of debts which plaintiffs claimed, uh, and as we saw here, the vast increase in the number of debts. But what happened when the defendant as happened only in a minority of cases, turned up and actually put on a defence contesting the merits of the plaintiff's claim. Then as now, most cases settled. And in the 16th century, most cases settled well before uh, a defence was put on, never mind a trial was had, never mind the case goes to judgement, never mind they attempt to enforce that judgement. And what's so striking here is when you look at the percentage of debt cases which the defendant bothers to turn up in court and defend, it's about 10%. It's a tiny minority of these debt cases result in a defence being put on. So the vast bulk of litigation is basically just a commercial pressure to get your debtor to pay up without any full going attempt to engage the machinery of litigation in a hard fought battle uh, before the jury at the assizes. By contrast, look at the very high proportion of real property disputes which are defended. And that's another key indicator of what's going on economically here. Yes, it's perfectly true that ta trade is increasing, merchant debts are increasing, but what people really care about, the actual value uh, of their wealth, is still found in land. And that's why it's worth your bother turning up to defend lawsuits about land ownership. In a way, it's not worth your bother turning up to defend suits about debt. So, some final thoughts about uh, the point I've just been making about uh, the width of claims that are brought. The first thing to emphasise uh, which might not go without saying in other societies in early modern Europe, is that litigants, even in these, by uh, the standards of the time, quite pricey and prestigious courts, were of a very diverse range. 70% of the litigants involved in the materials that I've been showing you were below the rank of gentlemen. So a majority of litigants in this court are ordinary people, they're not gentlemen, they're not nobles, they're certainly not the, the king or queen themselves. And the other statistic which is really striking is the vast expansion in the number of lawyers in the period that we're talking about. Now this is important because unlike now, and I can say this as a practicing attorney in Australia, legal fees were fixed uh, in 16th century England and at a conventional rate for a term's work by any attorney, regardless of their quality, regardless of their esteem. And it was set at a fee that most ordinary working people could in fact afford. Most ordinary working people in Western societies cannot afford the going rate of, if I may say, people like my, myself working in commercial litigation these days. But in the period between 1460 and six, uh, 1480 and 1640, so think about you know, a century either end of the period that I'm talking about, the number of attorneys working in the common pleas went from 180 for the whole realm of England to an astonishing 1,750 in a 150 year period. So many more people could access legal advice. Inflation had made that legal advice much more cheap. And therefore, it's hardly surprising that if something becomes cheaper and more accessible, there should be more of it. So, to come back to the starting point of Yering's quote, with all due respect to one of the greats of European legal history, 
it wasn't indeed the ideal value placed by Englishmen upon the enforcement of legal rights that made merchants in Salzburg want to go to court rather than pay uh, the innkeeper an unfair amount. It was simply that in their home country they were used to the fact that litigation, especially about commercial debts, was cheap, accessible and fitted in with wider economic patterns. And so economics, rather than idealism, is probably the best explanation for this remarkable increase in litigation. Thank you very much. majority of that claims were based on a sealed deed. Um, so it was uh, action of debt on the base of con uh, convert convention, am I right? So it depends which court you're talking about. Uh, about the central court. About In the central court, court, yes, court that's right. Because just uh, it is the same period when the action of debt as a main contractual action began to be substituted, push, pushed aside by the new action of assumption. So I just, it's maybe it's not particularly relevant, I just wonder, what could you call their action of debt still the main contractual action for the period you are talking about? Uh, yes, for a couple of reasons. Firstly, it is perfectly true that most debts uh, well, a great many debts did involve sealed bonds of obligation. So in technical terms, it was a deed or a specialty rather than what we would now label as a contract. Uh, but in fact, the action on debt did not require the existence uh, of a sealed document. Uh, so when we say most debts involved sealed deeds, well, yes, that might be true, but that's not because of a requirement of the action in debt. The point that you're making about the development of a sumset is very important to what we would now label as the law of contract, although of course the label of contract didn't exist until much later. And what that reveals is that within the action for debt, you've got uh, bifurcation. On the one hand, there's something which looks like an agreement-based law of contract, uh, which uh, our modern law of contract particularly comes out of a sumset. But there's, uh, at the same time, there's the second strand, which was simply, you owe me money, in which you didn't actually need to state that the basis upon which you owed money was an agreement. And if you don't need to say there's an agreement, well, then you don't need to specify whether it was under seal or, uh, or otherwise. So you're perfectly right. A sumset is very important, particularly at the end of the 16th century into the 17th. But for the period that I'm looking at, it's not particularly important all the more so because it was the King's Bench for which we have less detailed records and not commonplace at that point in time in which you would see records of a subset. I go to join your lecture with one question. At the time when the Ottoman increase in, in, the, in, the, case, in the case in the, in the case of the King Court, the two sessions due to discretion, is there a decrease in the amount of cases in the local courts? That's a very interesting question and a very important one uh, because, of course, one theory about the increase in litigation in the central courts is that people uh, dropped off litigation in local courts. In fact, and, and that was a long-standing <coughs> assumption that this was just uh, one step in the long history of the centralisation of the English state that local franchises, borough courts, manor courts uh, and the like, their litigation transferred into the central courts. In fact, it seems like the volume of litigation in local institutions either held constant or itself increased. Uh, so it's not as if the increase is directly explained by a transfer of work from one institution to another. Uh, it's perfectly true, though, that there were some categories of litigation heard in the central courts which would not typically have been heard in local courts. And that's why this broader economic shift is quite interesting, because uh, 
if you're a London merchant and suing someone in the provinces, you probably firstly couldn't be bothered to ride out to the borough court of Reading in Berkshire to sue because you're in London, you've got more profitable things to do with your time. But also the jurisdiction of the borough court at Reading might not cover uh, a debt which was in truth incurred in London. So because of economic changes, that is, people doing deals uh, over greater distances than used to be the case, there is indeed a new category of litigation which starts to emerge in the central courts, which would not have been heard in local courts. But that's not to say that those local courts suddenly lost their original volume of um, dispute resolution work. Thank you. So more questions will take them at the end of the lectures. Thanks very much, Thank James. You. Um, our next speaker is Ian Yazvistova, graduate of law.